Hi everyone, welcome to the Lattie Lounge. Um, I'm really looking forward to today's chat. We're going to be talking with former teacher turned fashion designer, the lovely Karen Arthur. So I'm just going to say hello to a few people. Hi Claire, hope you're well. I can see Karen there. So I'm going to just request that you ask to join Karen. And then we will go live. Hello everyone, very excited for today's chat. Hope everyone's doing well. Um, as I was just saying before, there she is. <laughs> How are you? I'm called Blue of my bedroom. Oh, it's yeah. So, so colourful, you're all matching. <laughs> oh, no, I'm a bit matchy matchy today. Um, well, you I was allowed. feeling red. I was feeling red, so yeah. And yeah, I definitely. My, I put my blue jumper on for you because I normally wear black or beige and I thought, I can't talk really? to Karen and not wear something colourful. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Anyway, listen, lovely to see you. Lovely to see you, darling. Are you well? I'm all right, thank you. I just wish it wasn't such miserable weather, but I'm all good. So listen, I'm just going to quickly give everyone a, li a brief introduction to who you are. Although I'm sure most people probably know who you are now. Um, so hi everyone, welcome to the Latte Lounge. Um, and I'm really happy uh, to say that I'm going to be chatting to former teacher turned fashion designer, Karen Arthur. Uh, we're going to be here for about half an hour and we're going to be talking about how it's never too late to change careers and follow your passions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the fantastic podcast, Menopause Whilst Black. Um, and also, of course, we want to talk about the Davina McCall documentary that you appeared on last <laughs> month. How can we not? So listen, um, it's great to have you here. And I thought what would be really helpful, Karen, is if you tell everyone a little bit about kind of, you know, your early life, you know, and career as a teacher, and then what led you to changing careers to what you're doing now? Oh, wow. Just a little story. Straight in um, <laughs> Thank you for inviting me on, Katie. I really, I really appreciate it. I think that um, we get to an age where we think that um, we, we feel trapped and that's what happened to me. I felt trapped. So I'll start by, I'll, I'll take you back uh, <laughs> several decades. Um, my mother taught me to sew when I was 15. That's the first thing. And I always used to say when people asked me, oh, it was because I had hay fever and um, it, I had to stay in and therefore she wanted to teach me something to do. But retrospect has made me realise that it was also just a few months after we'd split, um, our dad had left. So I suppose it was also a way to bond, a way to be around her. I certainly wanted to be around her more. So, um, so I have always sewn. I, I toddled off, I was brought up in Banbury in Oxfordshire and I always knew I was gonna leave, it's tiny. Uh, I knew there was something a little bit more out there for me and um, I wanted to go to university but I didn't know what I wanted to do and in those days it wasn't university it was poly you went to polytechnic university or like a technical college um, but we had a technical college and I didn't want to stay in Banbury I love dancing I was a I like to go to the disco I like to go to roller you know a disco and all that kind of stuff and when my art teacher said, you can do a degree in dance, I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> so I looked, I think I looked for two places. Uh, I looked at Laban in, in New Cross in London, and I looked at Leicester Poly. And they were doing a performing arts degree. And because I was into music, I played the piano, um, I was very dramatic, I'm a drama queen anyway. Um, I thought, well, let me do all of that. And also, my, we were a little nervous about me going all the way to London because there wasn't any accommodation. Um, I think mum was a little bit worried about me being in the big smoke or, you know, all on my own. So I went up to Leicester, I got, um, and I did a performing arts degree. And then after I did that, I kind of did a little bit of, you know, um, teaching in community centres and stuff like that. And I thought, let me get a qualification, and then I can go into teaching got my postgrad and then moved to London when uh, in those days in a London 
education authority was a thing. So you were interviewed as a pool and then they farmed you out to whichever school needed you. So I always taught dance and I taught dance for a co almost a couple of decades. And I loved it. I loved swanning around in my, with my big, you know, um, I used to call it ghetto blaster. We don't call it that now. What do we call it? Tape recorder thing, CD <laughs> player. <laughs> words, words, what are they? And uh, a bright pink um, jumpsuit that I used to teach in from Pineapple. And I loved it. And then I moved across to pastoral be simply because I was asked. A lot of things I've fallen into, if I'm honest. I mean, I'm not trying to dumb down my talent. Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, I just followed what I liked doing. And when I was asked to be a pastoral leader, uh, I thought, oh, yeah, I'll try that. I'll try anything once. And I absolutely loved it. So my last few years of teaching were actually, I was a head of year in a girls, head of year in a mixed school, then head of something, year in a girls school. And then I moved across to be head of house in a boys school. And I loved it. I loved it. I loved it until I didn't. In all of that time, remember, I've been in teaching almost three decades. Teaching changed a lot. The internet took hold. Emails. Um, the Tory government. Um, you know, lots of things changed. And teaching was my apps. It was everything. It was it consumed everything I did. It was, you know, first thing I thought of when I got up. The, you know, last thing I thought of when I went to bed and then I, you know, and then we, I was bringing work home as well. And in the middle of that, I split from my partner. We'd had a 20 year relationship and we had quite a difficult split. And so after that, I threw everything into making sure I had the house, that my girls were OK and ignored everything else. And as we know. <laughs> that's not a thing you once you start ignoring what you need to take notice of your body and your mind they find a way to catch up with you so I had a good I don't know 10 years you know working really hard um putting money into the house making sure my girls were okay and then yeah and then it got to where are we 2014 and both my girls went off to university. Uh, one went to university for the first year and the other one was going back after a uh, common. And I, I, I mean, this is a well-worn story, but some of you won't have heard this. I thought I'd love it. I thought I'd love having the house to myself, knowing where all my clothes were, making, you know, the house staying tidy. I thought I'd love it and I, it lasted for about two days. And th there's something about the silence of, when you're used to having people around, any investors listening to this will know, people around, even if you're not in their vicinity and you're not in the same room, just coming home knowing they're there or knowing they're coming home, there's a comfort in that. So it's autumn term, it's getting colder and darker everything is my job like everything that's all I do and one particular day I was in a meeting and the fire alarm went off and during the meeting that I didn't want to be at anyway I was mentally calculating how much when the meeting would finish so that I could go and do some more work and then how much work I could take home and do before I went to bed and got up and did it all over again and the fire alarm went and some things went, nah, I'm not doing this. So I, everybody traipsed downstairs to the fire, you know, assembly point, And I went upstairs to my office, put my coat on, grabbed my bag, my hat on. I remember what I was wearing. Beautiful cashmere Jaeger coat. <laughs> uh, grabbed my bag, put my laptop in it, put all my work in it. And literally waltzed past all the people waiting at the assembly point. And I was like this. And it's not like I was chucking my stuff up in the air and thinking, right, I'm not doing this. It was, I was going home to work because I had so much to do and that's all I could think about. Mm. So I got home, sat down, opened the laptop, might have had a fish finger sandwich, put the TV on, muted it, 
it gets dark. If you imagine it gets darker, my curtains are still up, my blinds are still up. So there's only the light of my laptop and the light of my uh, TV. It's cold. My boiler is broken. That's another story. <laughs> and I have done as much work as I need to do. It gets to around eight o'clock, quarter past eight. And I look up, we had an old carriage clock on the mantelpiece and I squinted to see the time. And I thought, oh, God, I, could, I really want to go to bed now. And then I realised that if I went to bed now, it would bring the morning quicker and I'd have to get up and do it all over again. And I burst into tears. And that was the beginning. Because I couldn't stop. I'd been crying a lot, but not, I just thought, oh, it's, I don't know what I thought it was, PMT, even though I wasn't on my periods. It was something. Um, I couldn't stop and thank goodness I worked something in me, worked out that this was something I couldn't do on my own. I've always prided myself on being someone who's just got on with things. Um, a lot of women do it. We, we, we're used to just plowing through, driving through, you know, and I'd been on my own. I wasn't in a relationship for a long time. So I was used to just doing the things. But this was something I needed help with. So I, scro I remember scrolling through my phone and dismissing people based on whether I would upset them or how near they were to me. So I didn't call my girls. I didn't call anyone in my family. There's absolutely no way they were going to know. I couldn't stop crying. Um, I had friends, but they were on the other side of London. I have a very good friend, Carolyn. And she lives nearby. Uh, half, uh, half an hour walk. Five minutes in the car. Normally when I call her house phone, her husband picks up or her kids pick up. And on this particular occasion, it was the first time ever, she picked the phone up and I'm going, Ugh. I'm not making any sense. She probably thought someone had died, you know, but she managed to, she just said, I'm coming. It's, mm. How old this were you, is what Karen? You How old were you I when was this was going? 51, 51. So I was, I was having symptoms. I was having tingly legs. I was having hot flushes, but I didn't decide it was menopause because I was focused on, this is the thing, I was focused on keeping my job. Yeah. I'd been a teacher for 28 years. What would I do if I wasn't a teacher? How would I keep my house? I was petrified. I thought about money all the time, God. I was petrified of losing the house. Where would I live? What would I do? So I called her and she came round, and we chatted. And I just, she said, I'll oh, go to the doctors. And I said, oh, it's fine. I just need a day off is what I actually said, which is absolute bollocks, by the way. Anyway, long story short, I got signed off. I, but I, I didn't get better because I focused on trying to get better to go back to work and that wasn't it. Yeah. So I did go back to work and I tried to ease myself in and it's just not possible. Anybody who's a teacher knows, anybody who has a stressful job knows that once you're back in the building, that's it. Yeah. You know. Um, and eventually I left. And I didn't leave, I didn't want to leave. I knew I didn't love teaching, but at the same time, oh, I couldn't do it. I, I felt like I didn't have a choice. It was either stay in teaching and die, and that sounds really dramatic, but I'm not, I, I'm not exaggerating here. I wasn't well. I was yeah. diagnosed with anxiety and depression, which kind of made me feel a little bit better because I thought, oh, I've got something to say now. I can tell them I've got something. That's my reason for being off because I felt so guilty. Yeah. Even the kids and, and not being strong Miss Arthur. It was a really odd, odd time. And it's it was really that, odd. It, it, listen, you're st I want to talk more about that. And I don't want to interrupt you because you're in a good flow and I, I'm fascinated. But there's a few people who are asking questions. I must say your story is 
it, it, a little bit similar to mine, bits of it, um, but similar to so many women we hear from. And I think what happens, and you're describing it perfectly, is you, every, you know, we bring up our kids, we're in relationships, some, of, some people like yourself split up from relationships, and you're very, very busy, 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 and then the kids leave, and you get to a point and you don't know if it's, is it the relationship breaking down? Is it the kids leaving? Am I just tired and I need a break? Um, and like you, I was signed off work with anxiety and depression. And you just, you know, also like you, I don't like to ask for help. And I want, you know, the strong one and I can do it all. And, and there's this, I don't know if you felt like this, but you for a bit, you feel like a, a failure. How can I, you know, have suddenly been this, you know, this mum and this teacher and this great friend and suddenly I'm not coping. Um, and actually a lady hit. Yeah, a lady here has written that's quite young. It's not actually. We're hearing women, you know, I was 43 when symptoms started. Um, yes. so, so you took time off um, and then sort of, you know, so did your symptoms get worse and did you then seek medical help or? The penny dropped one day. I was doing downward facing dog here <laughs> in my bedroom. Both my windows were wide open. It's February. The windows are wide open. I, by this time, I got the boiler fixed. And every day I was writing a note for myself saying, call the gas people, my boiler's broken. And then I realised that my hot, the, the temperature change was me. I was the problem. And I actually stopped and laughed, you know, because I thought, of course, Karen, that's what's going on. So I, my doctor had offered me antidepressants, which is incredibly common. Same. But I, and even though in the same appointment we talked about um, menopause and we talked about work and we talked about other things, for some reason, because my doctor didn't make the connection between anxiety and depression and menopause, I didn't. So I just thought she was offering me antidepressants because I had anxiety and depression. So that made total sense to me. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I said, you know what, I'm, I'm good. Uh, I will go and try some other stuff. I've always been someone, my mother's very holistic. Uh, you know, lavender is the cure for everything. Uh, and so I kind of wanted to go and try other things. So I, I, I finally, finally went into therapy. That, I will say, was the best thing I did. Um... I learned mindful meditation. I read, I half read. I've got it's John Kabat-Zinn's book, Four Catastrophe Living. It's that big, guys. It's 25 bloody quid as well. Um, I read half of it, but the half I read was really good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I went to a herbalist uh, and she would, you know, do a little concoction and I'd drink that for about three months. Do you know what? People ask me if it worked. I will tell you, I don't know. But I will tell you this, when I sat down in her office for my consultation and she listened to me for an hour, I was like, it was the first time I felt, first of all, I, it was the first time I was telling a professional this story. It's not like when you go to the doctors, you've got 10 minutes and you go, you have a list and you go, and this, and this, and then it's gone. Whereas yeah. with the herbaline, it felt, I felt held. That's how I felt. And I and when people talk about different holistic things, whether it's acupuncture, whether it's not therapy so much, but, you know, massages, all those things, I advocate all of that. Shit. Because if it makes you feel good, and if, it, if it's something that, you know, um, I don't know, helps your nervous system to just lower, I, I'm, I think all of those, that, that stuff, with you you know absolutely so I, I did lots of things and but in that silence because I'd gone from being really really busy to not wanting to see everybody and not having a job I was fun employed as I called myself um it it gave more it gave me space to get worse that's what actually happened so I got a lot worse uh before I, I started to get better I just went in to myself I didn't do a lot. And I avoided people. I avoided the kids because I, I, the school I used to work at is at the top of the road. So I'd hear all the kids going up the road. So I'd avoid those times. I'd hide in my room. I felt 
guilty, guilty, guilty that I'd let so many people do. Um, I screened phone calls, stayed under my duvet. I was not the Karen in front of you now, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, and all this symptoms were, my main symptoms were the tingly legs, the brain fog, yeah. like not remembering, not turning up to, you know, before, this is the thing, sorry, before I left teaching, for a good five years, I, I used to come home for lunch. That was my non-negotiable. I needed to leave the building and I'd come home I'd um, I'd have a cup of something and then I'd set my alarm and have 20 minutes now. I was knackered all the time and I thought, oh, that's just getting old. I spent a fortune on, do you know Floridix? Yeah, yeah. That like it's high and... I yeah. spent a fortune. Same, yeah. I didn't know that that it... So I didn't know, perimenopause wasn't a thing. No. So no. I didn't know what it was. You know, so I was just thinking, oh, I'm getting older. My job's stressful, you know. That'll be it. So I'll I'll chuck Floridix at it, which doesn't taste very nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I did that. So what actually? What did you do that actually helped you? Because obviously we want to get to the fun bit, which is the fashion and the fun how... bit. Well, so we, we, we the want... fun. Yeah. I talk about 2015 being my pivotal year. It's the year I left my career behind having never thought of it. It was the year that my Aunt Monica passed away. My Aunt Monica lived in Peckham. Um, I was charged with being the executor of her will. She had no children. And whilst I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna lie and say we were close, we, I would, uh, we spoke maybe three times a year. Um, because she became very ill and came in and out of hospital, I was the next person, so I was the one who visited her. I was the one who went to her flat, et cetera, et cetera. But I wasn't expecting her to die. Mm -hmm. I thought, I had in my head this fantasy of the perfect niece I was going to be and all the things we were going to do together. And then she didn't come out of hospital. And that, that all happened in, the, in those same months, six years ago this month, actually. So I start, what, how I know that I how I realised I started to get better is because my relationship with fashion changed. I've always loved fashion. I've always been someone who watched the trends, made sure I was up to date, loved outside validation. My God. Lo I liked something slightly classy, sexy, I would call myself. Uh, at school, it was head wrap and heels, you know, that kind of thing. Um, much more understated earrings. <laughs> 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 Conventional. Yeah. As I started to get better, I noticed that I would choose clothing, I'm looking around my room, that deliberately made me feel better. So there's one particular day, and I remember it so vividly. I was going to a jazz festival at South Bank, and I'd arranged to meet a friend. And this is the trick I would do with myself. I'd meet, arrange to meet a friend. That way I couldn't let them down. So I'd have to leave the house. I got out of the shower. I was late. Uh, and I didn't want to go. I sat on my bed in my towel and I wanted to get into bed. I was, the pull to get into bed was so strong. And I thought, no, my friend's waiting for me. What can, I looked around, I thought, what can I wear that will make me feel better? I had, I had a couple of my Aunt Monica's pieces of clothing and I'd been wearing those. They made me feel closer to her. On this particular occasion, so I have her bangle that I've, I haven't really taken off since she passed. I wore a bright kente cloth um, head wrap, a yellow uh, top. I basically clothed, chose clothing that made me stand tall. Um, and it, and I, I kept thinking, I just have to get to the station. If I can just get to the station, I'll be okay. Once I get to the event, I'll be fine. It's just the getting there. And that, it, that did the trick. And then I started to do it deliberately. And I do it deliberately every day. And it is the oddest, most wonderful feeling because when I started to talk about it, I started to talk on Twitter and I used the hashtag where you're happy. I, I thought, well, if this is working, why isn't everybody doing it? I don't understand. I couldn't get my head round. I still don't get my head round it because I'm quite evangelical about talking about where you're happy because 
it takes a certain kind of confidence. And I think menopause gave me that confidence because menopause gave me the don't give a fuck gene. It literally made me think, I don't care what anybody else thinks I'm supposed to wear. I'm going to wear this. And it, it just, not only does it make you feel better, but the people who, it often makes other people feel better as well. But I have this kind of, I'm going to wear this today. I also feel I'm 59 now. And I will say that I know so many people. How many people do we know that haven't made it to 50, that didn't make it this far? Yeah. All those clothes we have in our wardrobe that we're saving for best. Best for what? Best for who? You know, I feel that if you feel like putting on that gown that you wore to some event 10 years ago that you miraculously can still fit into, bloody put it on. You know, um, so wh that's what where you're happy it is. It, 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 it enabled me to own being a fashion creative. It enabled me to have fun with my wardrobe, you know, and try different things in different ways. Um, but it's and it amazing. Me I must, I must um, interrupt there because it's quite amazing because a lot of women, and myself included, when they go through menopause, it can make you go the other way in terms of you lose confidence. And actually all I wanted to do was wear black and beige and grey and kind of sort of yeah. camouflage against the wall um and and the other thing a lot of women say and you know i put on four stone in weight at the time and a lot of women put on weight and you lose that confidence that i would love to wear amazing colorful clothes but because i'm so overweight i don't want to draw attention to my sort of extra large frame so i mean it's it's really you know hats off to you that that actually was you know the thing that sort of brought you out was it just the fashion that that kind of made you better or was it leaving work and having to actually forcing yourself to rethink your life i mean did I you take tried... hrt if you don't mind me asking as well because that's a no i did take hrt and at the time i mean hrt has come a long way and and there's a lot of um stuff in the news about it now but at the time i was the I'm not taking HRT because I want to go the holistic route. And also my mum didn't take HRT. So I felt really strongly that if she could do it, I could do it. Um, I have slightly different thinking around that now, but no, I didn't. And no, I'm yeah. not at the moment. Yeah. But I will say this, my body changed. I wore black for a long time and gray and where you're happy. Isn't just about wearing color. It's about, it's about wearing what you like. And our bodies do change. And I think, remember, I had a dancer's body, for God's sake. I had a washboard stomach. I can't find it. <laughs> I don't know where it's You know, my boobs have changed. My yeah. boobs are bigger and bigger. You yeah. know, yeah. my bum, my bum can't keep my knickers up. <laughs> I'm the same size, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yeah. I've, got this image of, I've got this image of your knickers now imprinted on my brain <laughs> I mean that's one of the reasons I started making knickers I make wear your happy pants because I wanted knickers that I love but also that would actually stay up but anyway I'm okay. my point is that yes it is not easy it absolutely isn't easy and I haven't always looked like this but I my body did change relative to me this is the thing. People look at me and think, oh, you've got nothing to worry about. You're obviously a size, whatever you are, blah, 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 blah. But you, that's my, it's my body. So I know what I look like and I know which bits wobble and which bits I, at the time, didn't. But now I honestly, honestly don't care. But it's a daily battle. Yeah. When, I, when I come out of the shower, I'm not, you know, running around, oh, look at me. I'm not doing that. You know, it's, it's. I've learnt to love myself. I do affirmations. I talk to myself. When I first did it, I thought I was, I thought it was a little bit bonkers. But these things, these daily self-love practices work. And, but you have to practice and you have to strongly believe that you are worth it because you are. Mm. We are taught as, we are held up for looking young, um, uh, helping you know, putting other people first. We must remember that we cannot look after other people if we don't look after ourselves. And I learned that the hard way. 
But I don't want my girls, I have two girls, 26 and 30, I do not want them to get to 50 and decide to live their lives. Mm. I don't. I want them to start doing it now. And I I want more women, all women, um, to recognise that it is not selfish to look after yourself. You cannot pour from an empty cup. It's not actually physically possible. Yeah, and that's why the, and, and to be honest, that's exactly why I set up the Latte Lounge, because nobody shines a spotlight on us. We are the sandwich generation. We are looking after teenage kids. We are looking after aging relatives. We are, you know, trying to keep jobs down and fill the fridge. And, and actually, we are bottom of the pile, below the dog, you know, below the postman. Well, not below the postman. I hope I'm not below the postman. Um, but the point is... <laughs> Don't tell my husband. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, you've hit the nail on the head. You cannot, you cannot possibly look after those that rely on us unless we're looking, you know, after us. So, look, I, I want to ask you because I, I do want to go back to the fashion because I, I just, I think it's amazing what you've done. But just let's just quickly talk about the podcast. Um, for those of you you don't know, most people know, but um, you're the host of a podcast called Menopause Whilst Black, and I know you're very committed to helping diversify the menopause scene um, and sort of centering those midlife stories of Black British women. Um, why is there a taboo, um, and, and why did you decide to? that this you know was something you wanted to do well I, I this time last year black square summer as a that is not my phrase but it it's brilliant um george floyd was murdered ahmed arbery was murdered brianna taylor was murdered we were all at home on our computers and you couldn't avoid the news yeah. and I was one of those, you know, black Instagram accounts that suddenly received a lot of attention. And I was grieving. I was grieving for racism. I was grieving for, you know, people who were looked like me, looked like people related to me who were being killed and the injustice. And I got, I, first of all, I was upset and then I got very angry. Um, so I'm at home making masks like many fashion creators were, um, grateful for the distraction, grateful for the money, but also wondering how black women were coping with their menopausal symptoms and also coping with the trauma that we, because that, basically that's what it was. We were watching trauma. That's yeah. racial trauma. And so I did a video about it and I posted it on Instagram and the, the st it starts with, if you Google menopause and click images, what do you see? And you see a sea of very sad, very old white women with fans and their heads in their hands. Um, and whilst that is a stereotype that just, it, it's just needs going in the bin, the other side to that is I didn't see anybody who looked like me. And this was part of the problem when I was, when I realised I was menopausal six years ago, is that when I Googled anything, at three o'clock in the morning, trying to work out what symptom was what. I didn't see anybody who looked like me. You could be forgiven for thinking that menopause was only something that white women went through. And in fact, somebody on my podcast, Menopause Diva said, I thought I had a white woman's disease. That's like, that's bonkers. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, like when, it, it, it's, we're just not talking about it. Women aren't encouraged to talk about our bits, anything to do with sex, at the best of times, especially as we get older. And as black women, it is even worse. And there's lots of reasons for that. And often it's just generational. We, we, we don't like to air our dirty linen in public, so to speak. Yeah. But also a lot of our mothers um, um, went through menopause without HRT, without talking about it. It was something you got on with it. I started to do my own research. I discovered that black women are more likely to start menopause up to two years earlier than our white counterparts and often suffer symptoms for longer, particularly hot flushes. Um, and I thought, why isn't that common knowledge? Where is the research? There's research from 2007, uh, 22 uh, uh, UK women, UK based women, feel that in black women, Four of them, four, that's not four, that's three. Four of them um, identified as black British. That's bonkers. So I did my own survey 
had over 230 women filled it in, black British women specifically. And out of that research, one of the things that, came, one of the main things was no one asks us. That's number one. And the other thing was it, it felt like there needed to be more of a research. There's a wonderful woman called Om, Omishadi Bernie Scott who has a podcast in America called Black Girl's Guide to Surviving Menopause. And I had been listening to that to it for a year. There was nothing over here. And it's not like I wanted to set myself up as a podcast host, but sometimes you have to just get on with it. Yeah. So I bought a microphone and I taught myself to edit and here we are. And we're in season two and series two and... The feedback is good because it's just that women all over the world need to hear. We all need stories that resonate with us. And if a story that you've heard five times, the sixth time you hear it from someone who looks like you or whose parents are from the same country as you and it resonates, then that's the one. And so I that's why really, mentioned... it's really interesting because um, about three years ago, I asked on our Facebook group for, um, you know, some black women to come forward with their stories because I wanted, you know, diverse stories to put on the website and absolutely nobody came came forward. And eventually I reached out to, uh, you know, uh, Nina Coopers, who, um, yeah. you know, yeah, Nina, yeah. yeah. And, she, and Nina um, is the founder of the Black Women in Menopause. And, and she was telling us the same as you, the frustrations with the lack of diversity in, in the mainstream media um, when it comes to menopause. And one of the things um, she was telling me, and I, I found it really interesting, was the whole thing of, around sort of life, you know, ethnicity, ugh, ethnicity, can't even say it, you know, lifestyle, diet and activity, mental attitude. You know, we were looking at socioeconomic status. Do they play a part in a woman's menopause journey? And even things as simple as sort of, she was saying, you know, finding products, you know, for, because obviously, you know, black women might have different hair or, or skin. And so you need those sort of different products. So, you know, I just sort of, I, I just found it absolutely fascinating to hear about, we were talking about genes as well and the genetics. Um, if you look back in history, and apparently I didn't know this, um, but you know, menopause is, is almost, it's a sort of, it's genetically handed down to you. So if you were, you know, so the black community going all the way back, you know, when there was slavery and the stress, that, that stress hand, is handed down through your genes. Yeah, it's called racial weathering and well, what you're talking about is um, racial trauma, but also yeah. what I was also talking about was racial weathering. So they're two different things. So there's ancestral trauma, yeah. uh, which is handed down, yeah. but also racial weathering, so, which is about knowing that racism exists, being um, subjected to microaggressions. The thing, what I was talking about about this time last year, it it play it basically weathers you. It weathers your body physically, and it weathers your body mentally. So it stands to reason. This is research from Arlene Geronimus back in the nineties. It stands to reason that it's important. I feel that black women need to take much more uh, notice of this much much earlier, um, and to take much more care as well. But I, but honestly, I didn't, I didn't, I guess I was reluctant to start the podcast because I thought everybody would think I was a, a expert. I'm not. And I, and I guarantee, I, I'm not even really an expert on myself, but I know a lot about my own journey. But I will say that my job, my purpose, my goal, whatever you want to call it, is just to get more women talking and more black women talking about menopause. Stop, because we need menopause to be some i want you know in 20 30 years time women looking back going why were they making such a big deal about menopause it's just something that do you know what i mean i want it yeah. to be normalized, normalized yeah. menopause is enough yeah. and passion. i think we i so, think you know i think get involved uh south asian cultures from yeah. lots and lots the more voices you hear the easier it becomes and the easier the transition is because then women have got resources to go to Absolutely. And we were talking this week to Tanya Glide, who's uh, set up trans menopause. Um, you know, you know, so we're talking about people go through menopause and her frustrations with, you know, seeing a lot of accounts of saying ladies, ladies, ladies. And I just think the bottom line is 
people do go through menopause and they need to find the right support and the right resources. And, and I think it all comes down your journey, my journey, millions of other journeys that, that you know, doctors are not being taught mandatory menopause training, you know, at, at medical school. So, and then you've got the WHI report on top of that. And so there's this such, there's so much confusion and lack of awareness, but I think what you're doing is amazing and you look amazing and you you make me happy just looking at you with all the you know the <laughs> color and the massive smile um so just let, let's talk quickly because I, I i just feel like we're, we're running out of a bit of time and we've got i've got i could chat to you all night tell me about the davina documentary because that open you know you're talking about let's get it all out there that has finally been the kind of thing that we all needed actually to reach that national coverage how did you get involved with that and how was it and what's the feedback been since well, we'll start with the last one. The feedback's been incredible. Yeah. That's that. I got involved. Uh, Kate Muir contacted me for who? March 2020. Yeah. They found me uh, based on where you're happy. Um, because they wanted an older woman who was living her life. And that's what I was doing, <laughs> basically. Yeah. So um, we had been in talks um, over a year ago you know, and then uh, COVID hit. And so everything was kind of put on hold. And then when we had that little window of flurry of activity, um, around, just before Christmas, when we locked down again, um, that's when we said, you know what, we've got Davina, let's get some filming in, come and come to your studio. And I'm like, uh, yes. So um, I, I welcomed the chance to be on that because the links between anxiety and depression and menopause aren't spoken about enough. I know that there's been some criticism around the fact that it was, you know, just about HRT and they didn't look at holistic things. And some of my friends were like, well, they didn't talk about your podcast. I said, well, first of all, when I filmed it, my podcast, I'd only put one episode out and that's not what the remit was, but also um, it's one program. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's the yeah. series. I think did amazing things. Props to Davina for speaking up and being that woman is so open and honest. And all the women, you know, Haley and Kate and all the women who spoke on the on the program, just being open and honest about their symptoms, about their journey. You know, Sam talked about the vibrate. It, it was absolutely <laughs> fun. I'm so proud to have been part of it and I am I feel privileged to have been able to um share my journey with mental well being because I don't think one you asked me earlier what one one thing helped me. I don't think it was one thing. I think it's I think leaving my job helped, but it wasn't just that. Yeah. And I and while it was a terrible, awful time, obviously I wouldn't have it any any other way because I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here doing the things that I do chatting to you, wearing red. <laughs> <laughs> and look, before I want to ask, listen, I want, I want to ask you two more things and there's a, a few oh, questions that people want to ask. Um, your, the, go, let's go back to the fashion. Where, where is your studio based, if you don't mind us, and what sort of clothes are you making? So I work with women only. And I like to, uh, I create clothes for women who want that often it's special occasion. Sometimes it's just something that absolutely fits them. So many women, um, fashion isn't for us when we get older. It tends to be for people who want to buy clothes and throw them away um, or have a lot, you know, or fast fashion, that kind of thing. So my studio is based in South East London. Um, I teach um, anybody how to sew. I just I'm about to teach a nine year old uh, how to do fashion design. I'm very excited about that. Um, but I also create bespoke clothing for women who appreciate attention to detail and slow fashion and the service as well. So it's about uh, I suppose because you have to keep coming fittings and because I'm you know basically touching your body. You have to trust me. And so there is something about that attention to detail that, that women, particularly older women, tend to appreciate more. It's almost like a therapy session. Not that I'm asking probing questions, but 
it's almost like sitting in a hairdresser's chair. It's that kind of thing. But also I'm making one-off outfits and I want women that every single time they wear it, they feel amazing. When they look at it, they remember the journey they, they had to get there. Um, yeah, so and that's what I do. And the business is, the website's Redskin, is that right? Right. The Red, well, currently it's called redskin.co.uk, but full disclosure, it's about to be called Karen Arthur. That's easy. easier to remember. <laughs> yeah, because I, I have uh, .com because And if you Google thecarenarthur.com, Redskin UK comes up because it is literally being moved over as we speak. Okay, I know how that feels. <laughs> now, look, I, we, right. there's a, we've got a question here for you, which it was actually on my list. So it works perfectly to finish this off. What is your one piece of advice you could give anyone who's been pondering a change in their career or taking up some long lost oh. passion or hobby or dream? What would, you, what would your advice be? Uh, if not now, when? That's not advice, but I'm just telling you. <laughs> and this is hindsight, by the way, because... I, you know, I left because I felt like I didn't have a choice. There's no right time. So my advice I'm going to say is have a little bit of savings because I, I had a little bit of savings. So I wasn't destitute. But if you're spending ages thinking, if you're unhappy and you are ill or you're in danger of being ill um, and you, there is, even if there isn't anything that you're sure you're going to do, because I didn't know I was going to do fashion. I just knew I wasn't going to teach there. I thought I was going to get another teaching job. Then I would say, do it. Um, there are people you can reach out to, whether they're business coaches, whether they're therapists, you know, that kind of thing. Don't do it alone. I know that's not one piece of advice. But I don't think you can yeah. necessarily. Yeah. Do one piece of advice, but I would say that there's no right time but it's best to do it before it gets worse no job is worth making yourself ill for yeah. not one and and actually that that's a really good point so i i met someone they were called they, they call themselves a life coach and what a life coach does and i thought oh god that sounds a bit like you know frou -frou. Like, it, it was the best hours money i ever spent because they sat me down they said what do you love what do you hate you know what did you used to love and I, I relate to a lot of your story all my kids are very happy clappy I've got one at drama school in Oxfordshire funnily enough <laughs> and I've got one musician and one who's a playwright and you know one who's a writer so I, I actually said to them well it's funny because it's like I'm living my what I wanted to do through my kids you know I, I always loved drama and theatre and music and she said to me and I love writing so she was the one that said start a website so you can at least blog about you know your life and that's how the Latin Lounge started and be yeah. as you said if you like drama go join amateur dramatics if you like singing yeah. join a rock choir um you know I went to the pineapple dance studios like you go back to the pineapple dance studios and and so I would say to anyone you know if you can afford an hour with, with uh, i mean there are plenty of free we've there's loads of charities on our helplines of organizations that will actually provide an hour's life coaching with you and they'll even introduce you to you know business managers and all that sort of thing um so you know I think, I think people women are daunted by the money aspect they're daunted yeah. by the fact that they can always think of some we're more likely to spend 200 pounds on something for one of our kids than we are to spend time on ourselves yeah. and so i would say that we need to put that to one side but i would also say that me choosing me has meant that my daughters now know they can choose themselves and i can see that they are approaching life in a very different way than I did when I was that their age. So if you think, if you have children, not everybody has children, I understand that. But it's important for us, I'm saying us as older women, but I'm older than you, but bear with me. It's important for us to model what we want the other generations to be like as well. Because when I show up being a black, vibrant woman, ostensibly basically doing what I want to do and what I love on the whole, you know, it means that other women look at me and go, oh, she's doing it. I can do that too. I didn't have that. So I had to be that role model. 
but that doesn't mean that you do you see what i mean so i, I mm-hmm. feel like um i'm not dumbing it down i'm not saying it's not easy and it's, it's it's i'm not saying it's easy and i'm not trying to you know um what's the word i don't want to overlook the fact that some of this stuff can sometimes take money but you start yeah. with the intention and I feel that when you live intentionally and you choose yourself, I, I'm quite woo-woo and I believe that the universe sees that and it moves things around to help you. Yeah. So if, if you're just to do something you love or join a choir or whatever, not necessarily join it because you think, right, I'm going to be a singer, therefore I'm going to join a choir. Do it because you love it. That yeah. a old um adage you know do what you love and the money will come i thought that was a crock of shit well i'm sorry i'm testament to that you know so do what you love your your daughters must be very proud of you um i think it i think you're amazing i really do i think you're you're beautiful, Hello. you're inspirational, and I think I want to come and visit your studio. So, um, but okay, so Hello. listen, talking of which, so where they can listen to your podcast on um, Apple, is yeah. it? So there's several things. Yes, I'm on iTunes and Spotify, Menopause Whilst Black. Right. Tomorrow night, uh, I am running a master, I'm not running it, Pamela Wendell is running a master class, Wear Your Happy Master Class. I'm her guest. Um, the link to book is in her bio and it's also in my bio. bio. It's an hour of fun um, to do with where you're happy. I give you practical tips on how you can find everything you need in your actual wardrobe. And it's only 15 quid and it would be lovely to see some of you. Um, yeah, I do a lot of stuff. So yeah, if you're going to put the bio, <laughs> then just have a, have a mosey around. You'll see. Yeah. All right, and listen, we're gonna. This is all recorded. We're gonna put it on our YouTube channel, and we'll oh, share yeah. it with everyone afterwards, so they'll be able to what, read everything in the show notes. But thank you so much yes. for coming in again, thank and we for- need to have a real coffee in real life one day. That yes. would be nice. Look forward to that. All, all right. right, you God take bless care. And thank, thank you, everyone. You. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye. Bye.